Wow. <laughs> you know, I should have warned Desi, thank you for that introduction, that you've got to set the bar low. <clears throat> now, you've set it so high, I just walk under it and it's all good, right? So, um, all right, I'm going to start with a quiz. It's the pretest. Can you spot the hidden tiger? Don't point at that tiger, that's not the hidden tiger. Anybody? Where is it? The words on the side of the tiger, do you see the stripes? They read the hidden tiger. Now the nice thing about this, and there's a reason why I have this here, is because once you see those letters, you cannot unsee them again. And that's one of the things that I think that creative, when you have a creative solution or an idea, you see something in the world in a new way, it's almost impossible to unsee that again. So, so here to talk about uh, from the swampy lowlands of practice to the unbearable lightness of theory. It's a mouthful, but there's a story behind it. So I want to say hi to everybody. Um, and I want to thank the Torrance Center and UGA for inviting me here today. Uh, when I got into the hotel, I had these wonderful gifts sitting there that was very sweet. Um, but I do honestly feel a real strong sense of pressure here, you know, to perform. And the reason for that is social media, and in particular, this Facebook post that Tom Reeves put up there <laughs> the other day. I'm like scrolling through my Facebook feed and suddenly there it is. And I'm like, no, and he has all these nice words about me. And you can see that evil look on his face there <laughs> and that gleam in his eye. You know, thanks, Tom, you know. And so I promptly unfriended him. Um, that's that. No, not really, not really. But I do feel uh, a little bit of pressure there, and my goal today is not end up looking like that. All right. So before we start, uh, you gave this wonderful introduction, but I need to give my own version of that. So a little bit about myself and my dream, uh, which is to be on The Simpsons. You know, The Simpsons, that's what I would look like. And they've just had one Indian character on there forever. So it's time for a little bit of more diversity. You know, get me there. Formally, this is what I am, Associate Dean of Scholarship Innovation. Sounds really profound, still trying to figure out what it is. That's all my website and all that contact information. At Arizona, recent new transplant, beautiful. Um, Arizona's photograph I took a couple of uh, <clears throat> months ago uh, after spending 18 years in beautiful Michigan. <laughs> no, I mean, it is beautiful. It's cold, I must say that. But it is beautiful. In fact, I gave a talk somewhere where I didn't mention the fact it was beautiful and I got a lot of pushback for that. So I'm ensuring Michigan is beautiful even in winter. All right, so, okay, for the record. Um, and, you know, the, the subtitle of the Navigating Creativity, Technology and Education, it's kind of interesting that the sequence that those words are actually the reverse of sort of how it played out in my own life. So, you know, sort of education happened, my interest in education came first. Technology sort of happened along the way and creativity came really late to the party. So it's kind of cool to be hanging out with these artistic types here now, right? Um, well, here I am. And um, I'm going to sort of phrase this in terms of a story. I'm going to tell a story. Um, and a story, if you think about it, is a narrative. It's either true or fictitious. Hopefully most of what I say will be true. Uh, some of it may be not, but that's your problem. Um, either in prose or verse, it will be mostly prose and designed to interest, hopefully that will happen, amuse and instruct. Maybe some of that might happen. Um, so in the story, it's three parts, all good stories of three parts. So the past, the undesigned foundation of how I ended up doing work on creativity. Interestingly, it sort of seems inevitable that I'm here today, which is kind of interesting. Um, the present, which is this tangled weave of stuff I've been involved in, and the future, which is of course, unbridled speculation about where it's gonna be. And of course, as in all good stories and narrative, there have to be themes. So we have three themes. <clears throat> good things come in threes, right? So around scholarship, we're engaging the tangle of practice through networks of activity. It might sound like a mouthful. Hopefully, it'll make sense. This idea of indisciplined learning and transdisciplinary creativity, and as a personal level about how we, we create who we are, how the personal and the professional sort of intersect with each other. So on to the story. On to the first one, the foundation. And as B.F. Kinner said, I did not direct my life, it did not design it, things sort of just happened. And as it happened, I was born there in India, went to school in the northeast of India for the first few years, and then ended up here, which is a tribal uh, state just north of Myanmar, it's called Mizoram. And that's an interesting thing there is that uh, it's mostly, um, I mean, Mizo didn't have a script, so it was Christian missionaries who went there. So it's got a language which is Mizo, the script is uh, Roman. Uh, most people there are either Buddhist or Christians, 
and they have the kids there have a huge, at least when I was growing up, huge fascination with cowboys and Indians. And not the Indians in India, the Indians here, right? They, um, Native Americans. And they are wonderful. I mean, kids very early on, second, third grade would draw cowboys, you know, standing against the sunset with the horses. And because that was the cool thing to do, I would try. And I was regarded as completely incompetent as an artist because I could never do it as well as these kids did. And then a few years later, my father got transferred, moved to New Delhi, where in New Delhi, the kids there had nobody there was interested in drawing and sketching. And suddenly I was the guy with even that limited talent that I had was regarded as being the artist. And I think about that if that move hadn't happened, I would have never seen myself as having any kind of artistic talent. So it, it made me, makes me realize that how talent is a contextual thing. And so when we talk about creativity, when we talk about attributes that way, um, it it's really is this weird thing that happened in my life that allowed me to see myself as an artist. Because I would start seeing, because once people thought that I was an artistic type, I would want to be good at that. So I would look at, I remember this moment seeing a sketch on a wall and realizing how the side of the human eye can be drawn. And boom, now I start copying that. And so once you, you get that identity, it sort of grows on you. It's kind of interesting. Growing up in New Delhi, I love to read um, everything from, I think these are some of the most influential books for me, everything from Godel S. Bach. So that's where I sort of started thinking about the mind and creativity. Even though I wasn't, didn't know about creativity all that much, I wanted to be a physicist. So reading Carl Sagan and Gamow, uh, because of my mother, um, got into poetry, like The Wasteland was very influential for me. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, uh, I still use it as a reading in my classes around this interaction of humanity and, and machines and a relationship to them and thinking of values. Um, Martin Gardner, so all of these people are very influential. And then I made the mistake of going from undergraduate engineering, which in India, if you are good at science and math, you either become a doctor or engineer. So I ended up there. So I called that the four year transformation and the less said about it, the better. At the end of four years, I decided I wanted to make educational film. I had sort of given up confidence, I had lost confidence in myself uh, and my abilities. And I said, but I like science, I love math, I want to make educational film. So I ended up at the Industrial Design Center, um, getting my Master of Design in Visual Communications. And that's where everything that I'd done so far sort of came together. All these weird interests I had, and it was this idea of design and art and typography which just completely changed the way I think. This idea of design of where we go something in our head to some object out there in the world. Right? Whether it's a poem or a software became something that was really um, driving me. And so I ended up taking a plane and ending up at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign because I'd gotten interested in computers and technology by then and started working with the Mac and seeing the potential for education. Um, got my, uh, for my PhD in educational psychology and educational technology. I was in Boston for an internship and a friend of mine showed me this book, bought me this book called Discovering by, Root, by Robert Root Bernstein. And it's not a great book, it's, it's very discursive, goes on and on, but there was this one page in that book which just struck me and it showed different representations of the periodic table of elements. And I had loved the history of science and Mendeleev's sort of moment where he puts these things together and he predicts what Eka Germanium's properties are gonna be and then they discover it. It's like one of those great moments. And to realize that that representation that we see is just one of many. And so two key insights struck me there. One is the amazing creativity that scientists are showing. I mean, there are new ones being created. I mean, there's one from like 2000 in Scientific American. Somebody making a case, this is the best representation. Turns out they're all good or bad, depending on what question you're asking, right? So, but we deny this to our students. Our students are never given a chance to play with the elements the way the chemists are playing with them. The second thing I realized, which is kind of interesting, was this connection between technology representation and the subject matter and the idea, right? And so that comes to, for instance, this is the representation we all see. We see this on posters on the wall, we see this in textbooks. Actually, that set of elements down there should ideally be that way. And there is research to show that kids have a difficult time when they go across, span across to jump down, then bounce back up again. Why don't we see this representation in the books? Any guesses? Does not fit on the page. How awesome is that, right? As, it, as how technology constrains the representation of ideas and through that, our understanding of them. And so that ended up actually becoming my dissertation. So I did um, 
a dissertation on multiple representations of the periodic table of elements, allowing you through this hypertextual sort of frame to crisscross across these different representations, choose ones depending on their strengths and weaknesses, and so on. So thinking of the periodic table not as a table, but rather as a system with multiple sort of interconnections between them, right? And that's where this idea of sort of technology, content, pedagogy, and representation sort of started fuzzing around in my head. I got a job at Michigan State, and that's where I met this guy. Um, this is my colleague, Matt Kaler. This is what he would look like if he was on South Park, which he's a big fan of. He also had a ponytail back then. I was on the search committee. I tried so hard that for him to not get the job. I hated him. And I wonder what my career would have been if Matt hadn't been there. He was this big guy from Wisconsin who was a vegetarian. I was this guy from India who loves steak, born Hindu, but loves to eat beef. So it's a weird, weird coupling, right? Um, he's actually pretty cool to look, la look at with glasses and without glasses. Um, and we formed what I think is the ideal partnership. You know, so when I think about, I describe it often as a hot air balloon. And if a hot air balloon has to function, it needs two things. It needs hot air and it needs a ballast. That's me. <laughs> I'm the hot air. I'm the guy who gets really excited and then I'm here, I'm like performing, showing off, this, that. Matt is this guy who's like more of an introvert, but very critical, very thoughtful, very analytic, and it's this pairing. Because I think left to himself, he'd be sitting on the ground. Left to myself, I would have floated away and diffused, you know, just in the atmosphere. And so this became this amazing partnership with the two of us where we were teaching these courses on what we call learning technology by design. This idea that, that when we are teaching, when we are creating these technological tools, what we are doing is what I call duct tape and magic, which is you're sort of putting things together enough that it will work and you know that it might fall apart any minute, and, but you just keep. And it's the design stand. So that's the kind of thing that we're exploring. And this is around the time that we started thinking about how technology changes how we teach. You know, so, so my example of the greatest technological innovation ever is this one. The fact that you can go online today, anywhere in the world if you have the internet, and have access to human knowledge and information more than anybody else in this entire history of human civilization. That is a mind, you know, Tom and I were talking about that today, that we really live in very, very interesting times, right? And, but then people say things like, oh, but the information isn't vetted, there's fake news, there's blah, there's blah, right? And so that brings me to my 23rd law of parenting, which goes as follows. For facts, go to Google. For wisdom, come to me. Right? And the point is that the, that the, the fact that this information exists doesn't mean that we need to throw our, you know, critical sense out of the window. Maybe that's what our education needs to be more about and so on. And when you think about things like Google and all of this stuff that's out there now, right? It dramatically changes how we teach, right? But the other piece of that puzzle is also that technology changes what we teach. If you look at any form of human activity today, I have a friend who's an astrophysicist at Michigan State. He has ne I don't think he has looked through a telescope in 20 years. He buys time on Hubble or some telescope and they send him petabytes of data and he spends time writing software to create these fascinating collisions of black holes or whatever that he does, right? Um, look at the music industry. Everything from how we create music to how we sell and how we consume music dramatically changed due to technology. Um, of course, already gave you an example of the periodic table, right? And that all of this happens within specific contexts. So you might have a one-on-one -on -one situation. If you're an educator, you have to think very differently about that than if you were in this classroom in India where you have limited access like 30 minutes a day, twice a week, something like that, right? Or something like this where kids have devices, they can walk around, take pictures, do video, each time you have to think about education and teaching in a different way. And so that led us to, Matt and me, to this framework for technology, pedagogy, and content sort of coming together and understanding that what we do as educators, we sit at the center of that. So that's the work that's been sort of recognized. We were uncreative and called it the TPCK framework, which got people to ask us questions like, how do you pronounce that? Is that the toothpick framework? So, um, you know, we well, I got $50 and bought a vowel, you know, um, so it became the TPAC framework and then people couldn't actually pronounce it. Otherwise, it, you know, sounded it was like something from Bosnia, you know, with all the consonants in it. So uh, now it's the TPAC framework. And the argument is that whether you're teaching with any kind of tool, I mean, a pen, a pencil, a whiteboard, a blackboard, blackboard.com, all of these are tools and that technology and pedagogy and content really need to come together for successful teaching. Um, this is all self, 
promotion stuff, so I'm going to skip that. But basically, it got cited a lot. A um, couple of handbooks came out. Um, it's insane to think about the number of studies that have been done uh, following up on that. And then it's, and the part that's gratifying to me and I think to Matt as scholars is the fact that it's had significant impact on teacher preparation across the country in the world. You know, just met somebody from Turkey today, um, one of the students somewhere here. Um, there she is. Um, you know, but the thing is, it's that work that thinking about it, how it applies to practice is the piece that I think that's most interesting. Um, for me, I used, like, as you mentioned, I directed the Masters in Ed Tech program. I used to do a lot of workshops uh, with teachers in different school districts. And that's where another character makes an appearance, which is Lee Wolf. She co-directed the Masters program with me and her imprint and her influence is there in almost everything that I do. And one of the questions we would ask is, what is an educational technology? I'll come to creativity, it'll make sense. So all of these things, everything from a crayon to a book to a magnifying glass, these are all tools or video games, CD-ROMs, whatever. But the argument that we make is that there is no such thing in education, as an educational technology, right? So for instance, I mean, here is a scientific calculator. How many of you are carrying a scientific calculator with you right now? Actually, chances are all of you are because you have a smartphone, right? But you never see a kid carrying a scientific calculator per se because it's a single function device. Right, what we have are these and all these other apps that go with it, right? There is an app for that. But when I talk to educators about it, they often say things like that there is loss of control, which is what they mean is that when I'm teaching the Pythagorean theorem, somebody's out on YouTube, somebody's texting. But I say, actually, that's not real lack of control. Real lack of control is when you are doing that, somebody has gone online and found a different proof of the theorem that you didn't know. Right? Because the other stuff you can actually have rules for, right? You can say, I'm going to set up filters, I'm going to do this, that, and the other. <clears throat> what do you do about that? And part of the challenge that we face here is the fact that most technologies are not designed for education. But here's something that we as educators do very comfortably, which is not just educators, everybody, humans do very comfortably, which is we redefine technologies. So if I have to prop that door open, I won't think twice about taking a chair and putting it there. The chair wasn't designed for that, but that's okay. So here are some examples. Email. How many of you here have sent an email to yourself? Strange people here at UGA. <laughs> Seriously, I should leave now. But all of us have done that, right? For everything from, you know, sending a file home to keeping a record of stuff. Uh, I like type notes to myself and I send, we do all kinds of reasons for doing that. We don't think twice about it, but that's not what email was designed for. So I collect some examples of things like this. So this is, um, you know, lawnmower and a bicycle. This is a Chinese restaurant where they keep track of orders using, uh, what do you call them, clothespins. This is from India. This is called a Maruta, which is basically you go to a junkyard, find pieces of different cars and trucks or whatever, and you it's duct tape and magic, and it goes at five kilometers per hour. Piece falls off, tie it up, do something, you move on. The question is, why is this important? It's important because only repurposing makes a technology an educational technology. So any of these tools that are out there, when I talk to teachers, this is the one thing I say, don't go looking for the perfect tool. The perfect tool is the one that you have in front of you. The question is, how can you use it? How can you figure out a way of using it? So, I mean, this is a great one, Twitter. You know, so this was a lovely tweet, which is, we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters, right? But you can use Twitter in, in an educational context. I've used it you know, as a back channel, you know, where people can tweet about as we are reading texts and so on, especially in online classes, suddenly you start building the sense of community. And this is where it gets interesting is that repurposing is a creative and an innovative act. So repurposing is where we bring our creativity to bear on the educational task. And so when I was directing the master's program, we would think quite a bit about the, what is the kind of experience that we want to create for our teachers. And at that point, I was not really sort of reading the creativity literature as much. We were sort of playing it by, you know, by our common sense, understanding that spoon feeding in the long run teaches us nothing but the shape of the spoon. And so we came up with these principles of what would be a good sort of experience that we could design for our students so that they could see the world in new ways, so that they could interact with these tools and technologies in ways that are thoughtful and creative and appropriate for the content, you know, all the TPAC stuff. And so they learn to see ideas in the world around them, whether literally where we ask them to go and find letter forms in the world or 
more metaphorically, where we ask them to create simulations or this is a stop motion video where they're given 45 minutes to make a stop motion video which actually enhances a misconception instead of minimizing. Because sometimes pushing that further makes you realize what the misconception is, right? Creating experience where you have them construct knowledge. So this is an example of a cardboard challenge where they had to create a toy which had only which had at least two moving parts, had some kind of a function, and that's our teachers working on some of these things. Uh, this is on the cardboard challenge. This is some teachers in Chicago. And the thing is that we could see that our students were doing awesome things. Um, they would report back about things they were doing in the classroom. That was all great. We won some awards and stuff. But we really didn't have a framework or a theory for what we were doing. I mean, we would, it seemed commonsensical to us and we would clutch some things together. So it was time to get serious about creativity. And so that brings me to the second part of the story. where things get a little messy. So one of the things here is that timing I've realized is everything. And it was around that time that I read this book again by the Ruth Bernsteins, the same guy who showed me the periodic table. So he's played a big part in my life. Um, the Sparks of Genius. The second person there is Dana Hendrickson who joined the PhD program with an interest in creative. Till then I haven't had any students who had that, right? So that was, and then I decided to teach this class. The only way I figured that I could get into this stuff is by actually teaching a class called it's CP818, Creativity in Teaching and Learning. And for fortuitously at that time, I sort of started making sense of how I could advise students and how we could collaboratively work together. It took me a while to figure that stuff out. And so this is the Deep Play Research Group. Um, not all members are shown here. It's been an extremely productive sort of partnership with my students. I mean, I think we must have like 40 publications together in the last eight or 10 years, um, maybe more. And as we looked at the, the research on creativity, one of the things that struck me, and that's sort of the swampy marshland of practice, is that a lot of the stuff I couldn't apply to what I was wanting to do, what I was thinking of in a classroom context and so on. So here's an example. If you look at like, we did this analysis on, uh, there's a database of psych tests, you know, psychology measures and so on. So we did an analysis of that. So we're looking at measures by target population, targets that, you know, which were about for school students were around 19%. That wasn't as bad, as crazy as this one. So if you think about you're an educator, you want to be able to understand that, can I have some kind of a way of figuring out whether this is a creative space or not? What are the factors that go into that? I would want, I'm giving these kids open-ended assignments. How do I evaluate something like that? And if you see, the numbers on that are very low. And so these were sort of what we call the, the swampy marshlands of teaching, right? And this quote by Don Norman sort of speaks to that in a certain way because it says that educators are practitioners. While the, their goal is to have large important impact, while scientists are interested in truth. So they are interested in some nuanced difference between two different alternative theoretical frameworks, which is incredibly important, don't get me wrong. But for an educator, that nuance will just be lost in the noise of a classroom context. That's just it, right? And so this idea that, teach, that psychology is a science and teaching is an art, but the sciences never generate arts out of themselves. An intermediary inventive mind is required. And that intermediary inventive mind, that creative mind is that of the teacher. And so that is sort of our goal of our research agenda is that. So everything that we do has to work in a classroom context. And this is not to doubt or question the work done by others because we completely build on that. But our emphasis is really on the practitioner. What does it mean, right? And so what is it that practitioners need? They need strategies and approaches to teach content creatively, support students in developing their creativity, fostering a creative climate environment, whether with or without technology or different kinds of digital technologies and ways of assessing and evaluating creative products or artifacts. So thus unknowingly, we began a program of research on creativity. Can everybody read that? Read that still? So these are the ambigrams that Desi was talking about. So we started sort of a series of, again, this is completely unfunded work. This is just work that as a team, we'd say, okay, you're doing your own research, I'm doing my stuff but we are going to do this together. And so the whole series of steps sort of emerged out of that. 
Now that leads to a problem in sort of the storytelling of this, right? If I'm telling a story, I tend to we have to push it into sort of a linear narrative. Well, actually, what was going on was a lot more complicated. So, this is an attempt to, and I'm trying to squeeze a lot into it. So, the work we are doing on sort of evaluating creative artifacts is happening at the same time as I'm teaching this class. The artifacts from that class are being used to test that, which then go back and become a rubric to be used in the classroom, right? The work that Dana is doing around creative teachers and their avocations tells us that in the course we need to have blah, blah, blah. So you can see that it's a really tangled mess of activity that is going on over this past eight or ten years. So one of the questions that we had is how can we, for, for if I have to communicate this to teachers and so on, how do I describe what is creativity in the first place, right? And so there is of course the famous quote from Justice Potter Stewart talking about pornography that he knows it when he sees it. I think creativity very often we tend to sort of speak of it that way. I know it when I see it, right? And of course there's the great uh, definition of creativity given by... Really? You want to exchange creative gifts? Oh, well, you are the one that's in trouble now, buddy, because creativity to me is just like... It's like a bird, like a friendly bird that embraces all ideas and just like shoots out of its eyes, all kinds of beauty. Wow, Lemon, this is like watching Hemingway ride. Mark Hemingway. Yeah. So one of my favorite definitions of creativity. Um, so for this, we uh, went with some work done by Bessemer and Aquin, where they had this thing they call the creative product semantic scale, where they had these three sort of um, items, way of looking at creativity, like novelty, resolution, and style. And our thing was we need to also be able to communicate. I mean, that's a big part of the thing. I think part of the TPAC framework was that we could communicate the ideas in a powerful way. So the question, so this is how we sort of start talking about creativity and how we define it when we talk with educators and teachers. Keeps that same idea, but you know. So first thing in a creative idea that it's novel, right? It's fresh, it's unusual. That's usually how we think about it, right? The problem is that if just because something is novel doesn't make it useful, right? So that fork over there may be novel, I don't think you would choose it uh, to eat your salad with. So clearly the second thing is effective, that it needs to do what it's supposed to do. And so those are the kinds of words that would go with it. Now it gets kind of wonky in some ways because sometimes things that are not effective, for instance, this is a set of teapots that Don Norman talks about. And if you see the first teapot from your left over there, that one's an impossible pot, which means if you try to pour water out of it, you'll scald yourself. It's, it's because the spout is turned the wrong way. So you have to see that within the broader context of Don Norman being this guy who tries to collect cool things and he's showing off what a cool teapot he has, right? And so there is something about sort of the context and other, some people have called it style, some people have called it, there are different words that people have called it. What we say, it's the whole. It's sort of how it fits within this contextual whole. And so that way we get this really nice acronym that a creative product is new, which is novel, effective, and whole. So which is sort of a really nice way for us to communicate with educators because that, that's something they can remember, right? And then creativity then becomes a goal-oriented process of developing solutions that are novel, effective, and whole. Now, I don't have to <clears throat> make the case for why we need it. Of course, Newsweek every few years decides that there is a creativity crisis and puts it on the headlines. Um, but there are studies to show, and I thought you had Kim, you know, Kim come and talk about her work here, I think, a couple of years ago. And there are these studies which show that, you know, that CEOs, this one is actually scary because they rate creativity as being more important than integrity. I wish it were the other way around, you know, because one can very get very creative with accounting and stuff like that, and that's actually a problem, right? And of course, authors like Pink and others have argued this is big business, right? Um, one of the, the, the concerns that we had as a group, and I personally have very strongly, is that when people talk about 21st century learning, they often talk about the four C's, you know, creativity, communication, collaboration, and uh, what's the fourth one? Critical thinking. The problem I have with that is that creative about what? Collaborate around what? And so it sort of makes this to be the sort of neutral thing, this talent that we can have that we can apply indiscriminately anywhere. And so we did a, a study a few years back. This is a paper that won an award in Journal of Digital Learning and Teacher Education, JDLTE, uh, where we looked at like different frameworks and, um, of 21st century learning and came up with sort of an analysis of that. And this is sort of how it ends up. And if you'll see that the four C's are important, I'm not saying that they're not, 
but that foundational knowledge, that knowledge of disciplines, the knowledge of cross-disciplinary knowledge, or sort of the sort of values that we bring to the knowledge are seen as being as important. Again, this is not our interpretation, this is emerging from the analysis. We then followed it up with a survey of educators that we did, which recently got published. And when we see that, this sort of vaguely represents what educators feel as being important. It was very depressing to me to see that core content knowledge was given was almost the second lowest. So it was almost like the knowledge of a discipline was seen as being not important. And I don't understand how that can be because if you want to design, you would want to do game design, you have to know programming, you have to know a little bit of theater and experience design. I mean, that's expert knowledge that we have to bring to that. You want to be a good mathematician, you have to know mathematics. So how we can have that, with, you know, that, that sort of bothered me. And so, you know, sort of, sort of when we look at learning for the new millennium, you sort of two views and both are friends of mine so I can caricature them. So this is Bill Schmidt who goes to the Michigan legislature and makes arguments for we need more algebra, we need more rigor. And then Yang Zhao, the other friend of mine who's like, oh, this is only creativity. And, you know, and, and I feel that it's a false dichotomy because that's one of the things that has emerged from our work is that discipline knowledge is incredibly important because disciplines allow us to see the world in special ways. They give us purposes for the knowledge, the kinds of knowledge, you know, mathematics and music might look somebody who doesn't know either, like squiggles on a page. But they're very different purposes, they're very different representational schemes, there are very different ways of carving the world. And so I think that to me was like an important thing that we needed to bring it somehow to talk about the value of disciplinary across disciplinary knowledge as we talked about creativity. But as we started thinking and reading and uh, about where do new ideas come from, you know, we have somebody like this man who would guess is pretty creative saying something like creativity is just connecting things. To which I say that's easy, if that was that easy, I would be Steve Jobs, you know, so. But one of the things is for sure, this is Maria Popova, brain pickings, and she says that the creative process itself will never be easy. That magic moment when ideas click together and make a stable combination cannot be forced. However, we can optimize our minds for combinatorial creativity. So creativity comes from our being able to take these ideas and put them together in new ways by enriching our mental pool of resources with diverse, eclectic, cross-disciplinary pieces. So that's like a really powerful sort of a way of thinking about this combinatorial creativity, that you are deeply embedded in a discipline but also have this ability to pick from other areas and put ideas together. Um, this is a quote from a book in, so it's not new knowledge, the point being that this is a book written in the 1940s. So originally it depends on new and striking combination of ideas, but the only the more he knows of his own subject, but beyond that of other subjects as well. And so this is what we have called indisciplined learning. So you can tell I like bad puns. So the idea is that learning is deeply grounded in it, like creativity is deeply grounded in a discipline. If you want to be a good musician, you have to know music. However, it is also indiscipline in the sense that you are bringing influences and ideas from other places into that. That's what makes you a creative mathematician or a creative musician and so on. And so this dichotomy with art and science and foundation and creativity is to us a false one. And so examples of this abound. So this is Alexander Fleming <coughs> who discovered penicillin. And <coughs> that thing over there, by the way, is a painting that he made with bacteria. So he would paint with the solution and then you have to put it in the, and let the, in the Petri dish and let it, you know, overnight or however time it took. He does things in color. He was an amateur artist. And he talks about the fact that it was this sensitivity to color and nuance that allowed him to identify, you know, the penicillin. Uh, somebody like Nikolai Tesla, who could visualize and imagine entire machines in his head. And if it didn't work, he would imagine pulling out a part and putting a new part in. And this is one of my favorite quotes. So Boltzmann was trained as a musician and he's reading Maxwell's work on the dynamical theory of gases. And if you read that quote, I'm not gonna read the whole quote out, but look at the bolded parts. He's describing mathematics almost as if it's a drama, as if it's a play that's playing out with music. And how often do we talk to our kids about that? I mean, that's some work that I've been doing recently on aesthetics. So this kind of work features very heavily into that. And so it's not just the arts influencing, it's the other way too. So this is like, you know, how we go from a line, a square cube to fourth dimension. And somebody like Salvador Dali could take that and be inspired to make this painting. Where the fourth dimension becomes sort of a way of representing spirituality. 
We recently wrote a paper on these four people. They won the Fields Medal, which is sort of the Nobel Prize in mathematics. Maria Mirzakhani, first Iranian, first woman to win the Fields Medal. And the way she does math, she does this manifold spaces. She has sheets of paper lying on the ground and she just draws. And she draws and draws till she gets some insight and then she goes and does the math. Manjul Bhargav, first person of Indian origin um, to win the Fields Medal. Arthur Avila, first person of Brazilian to win. This was an interesting year. And this is what um, he has to say, um, Manjul Bhargav has to say. For mathematicians like music, mathematics like music or painting is a creative art. They all strive to express truths that cannot be expressed in ordinary everyday language. And they all strive towards beauty. And so when I think about this thing called art and I think about this thing called science, if I put them together and I turn it on its head, it becomes education. So these are the kind of silly things I waste my time on. And so we took this idea of transdisciplinary creativity that, that creative ideas come from other disciplines and took the work that Ruth Bernstein's had done and they had in their Sparks of Genius 13. And I always felt like 13 is way too many. How can you remember 13? So we collapsed it down to seven from this book. And that's been sort of the basis for the course that I teach. That's been the basis for some work that uh, one of my students did in her dissertation. And so looking at these different sort of perceiving, patterning, abstracting, embodied thinking, modeling, and playing as being ways of thinking that cut across different disciplines. They will represent itself in the discipline in different ways. So playing or uh, let's say uh, patterning would be different in math than in music, but the idea of patterning still stays the same. Now one can argue whether this is absolutely right or wrong. The question for me is that is this a productive way for me to talk to my teachers about ways of thinking about their curriculum? And so <clears throat> this basically we have all the pieces. How are we doing on time? All right, so I'm going to skip over some stuff because otherwise I'll go on forever and we won't have time for questions. Just give me a second while I figure out where I should pick up. That's my daughter when she was little. <clears throat> you can enjoy her while I... Okay, so I'm jumping over the, the part that I'm jumping over is the description of the course that we taught, the master's level seminar that we taught. Essentially in that seminar we had, we took the seven skills and every teacher, whatever subject matter you would teach, you would apply, let's say patterning or uh, abstracting to your subject matter in an activity that would help your students learn that subject matter, right? <clears throat> in parallel, we had them do a whole series of activities which were around their personal creativity, okay? So both of those things sort of going on at the same time. But as we were, <clears throat> our students were creating this open-ended artifacts, <clears throat> the question of how would we evaluate it came up. And so again, we go back to that creative product semantic scale, go back to this novel effective whole, and went and, you know, with a bunch of, uh, so these are some of the artifacts, for instance, that were created. So that's somebody who's trying to explain the idea of radiation and diffusion of heat and does it through a concrete poetry. I thought it was like really awesome. Um, this is somebody who's using kinesthetics to explain sort of uh, letter forms in Chinese. That's somebody who did this sort of trying to show sort of patterns in prime numbers. And so, you know, we did the usual thing of coding and intercoder reliability and, you know, so on and end up with sort of a coding rubric that allows us to, you know, with anchor examples, like what is a one, what is a three, what is a five, um, that allows us to evaluate um, a, 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 an artifact created by a student. Now it's not, as in all of these things, not 100% objective, but we've found that we have a sufficient integrated reliability with some training that it can be useful. In fact, we use this now in our class to evaluate the artifacts that students are creating. In fact, we tell them this is the rubric, you will be evaluated whether your, whatever you have come up with is novel, whether it's effective to what it's supposed to do, and whether it's sort of stylistically, holistically complete or not. The other important question that I was really interested in, this is Carmen Richardson, um, who's one of her doc students. Um, she was really interested in learning environment that support creativity, and so she worked on you know, how many of you know about these things called walkthroughs that principals and superintendents do, which is they have like a checklist where they go through a classroom in a couple of minutes, um, you know. So she was sort of interested, can we do something like that? So that was the project that she took on. But before I talk about that, I want to talk about the study that 
I think in my all time studies that I hate, this is one. And this one is where they did a study where the kids put, put kids in this blank sort of dead kind of a room, had them listen to some lectures about insects, facts about insects, tested them for recall, and then put them in some other room which had brightly colored things and argued that that room was better for learning because they could recall more of this random information that they had been given. These are little kids. And this got quoted in the NPR, this, I mean, New York Times, as if, <clears throat> I mean, to me, this is like the classic example of a study that completely disrespects what the learning context and environment can and should be. You go, you go in for a week. So if we take this argument to its logical extreme, we should put every kid in a cubicle where they, where they cannot look left, right, or center and just feed them information and they will be educated. So education and learning is so much more than that. So I had to dump on the study for a second. Just, I have to do that. I could go on and on about the study. Um, so she went through a pretty systematic process of, you know, looking at the literature, going through, and then working with a bunch of teachers, identified a bunch of teachers that she would do walkthroughs with, um, <clears throat> created a draft, then went through phase two, where she went to administrators, got their feedback, did walkthroughs with them. Pretty, pretty good uh, process. This is currently, under review, I think, unless uh, things are changed. It's under review, hopefully it'll get published. And I think that is actually a good contribution um, to, the, uh, to the field. So while all this was going on, uh, we managed to edit a book, uh, which is a collection of chapters on creativity, technology, and teacher education. And some of the best part of it was we got invited by, not invited, I invited myself. I basically pestered the editor till he agreed that if I could write a series for this journal called Tech Trend. So we've been writing a series called Rethinking Technology and Creativity in the 21st Century, have I think 24 articles now published in that and that's every three months we send them something. And that's been a wonderful way for us to sort of think through in a public way. So there are ideas in there which I go back and read now, it's like, man, I wish, I wish I'd phrased it differently, but that's okay because it forced us to, at this point in time, draw a line in the sand and say, okay, this is what I think. And I love that sort of public thinking that it, and now we are putting these books, uh, putting some of these articles together into two books that will be coming out from Springer. So we are editing those articles. In fact, one of them has been submitted. The other one is coming soon. And more recently, we started doing these interviews of top scholars in creativity. So you will recognize Mark Runko over there um, as one of the people we interviewed. And hopefully, once we have around 13 or so, we would make that into another book. So that would be kind of cool to see what these different scholars of creativity are talking about. And we've been started doing some content analysis of that. Um, and then uh, as a part of this group called the Edu Summit, we started thinking a little bit more around sort of a systems view of creativity. Um, wasn't very fleshed out at that point in time. This is basically chicks and the highs diagram. So we are thinking of how creativity can be located within a system rather than an individual. What does that mean in a world which is mediated by technology where gatekeepers, you know, if you think about people who are celebrities today on YouTube, they didn't go through the standard gatekeeping, you know, which earlier would be somebody in the museum would curate and say, this is good art. Now, you know, things have changed dramatically. But it got me thinking about the system's view, which brings me to where I am today, which is at Arizona State University. And thinking about slightly different things. One of the things that I'm finishing up now is this work around aesthetics. I've always been very impressed by the sort of the power and the beauty of ideas. And very often in school, we don't talk about it. We talk about, we give kids instrumental reasons. We say, learn trigonometry because it's gonna be good for you. Which is like a really silly reason to give somebody who's 16 years old because they can't, I've, I have teenagers at home. They can't see beyond their noses. Right? But if you appeal to what is sort of powerful and beautiful and moving, what scientists talk about, like here or here. And we already saw that quote, right? And that's true for programmers. They say code can go beyond the purely practical like equation physics or mathematics. Code can aspire to elegance. So we have a paper presented at a conference recently about aesthetics and computational thinking, which is again, not something that people often think about. So we have done a whole bunch of sort of ongoing studies that are coming along and sort of thinking about how we can come up with a framework that can um, 
help us think about it. So I'm not going to go into the details of this. If you're interested, this is a paper that we just submitted. I'm very excited about where this work is going. I think there's a couple of other publications that can come out of it. But thinking about sort of this aesthetic journey that can happen when we engage in science or we engage in mathematics, right? So you start with this wonderment through this process of doing science itself can be exciting because it's almost like detective work. And then there's a sense of fulfillment. But guess what it does? It just raises more questions. And that's a process that just can go on forever. And that's why these things can be very self, you know, self-perpetuating because there's a positive feedback loop. Because you'll have one answer and then you'll raise 50 more questions, you have new wonderment and then the process starts all over again. So trying to understand that, trying to understand how this can be applied in, in again in teaching. But more recently at Arizona State, which is really exciting for me, is this opportunity to, to start working really at a systems level, thinking about wicked problems, you know, problems that different people can even disagree on what the problem is in the first place. Thinking about design and education going beyond sort of materials and tools towards sort of systems level design. You know, so, so, and these are really fascinating because it's like the formulation of the wicked problem is the problem itself, right? That we know what the problem is only when we think that we have a solution for it. So to me, those things are really interesting. Um, so we are doing this work with the school district in, in Scottsdale. So this is a design day that we did where we had 170 people, students in the school, parents, teachers, administrators, school board members, community members, the mayor, you name it. And we went through this sort of structured but open-ended activity of reimagining what a day in the life of children could be. So that's creativity at a different scale. I don't think I even have the words right now to be right and articulate, to articulate it. But this is very exciting. I can see in the next few years, a lot of my time being spent thinking about these things. This is just this last Monday where we did the similar thing, this time with high school students. So, then finally at a personal level, um, I've been doing this visual wordplay and that led to a whole series of articles I wrote with a mathematician friend of mine. It led to this exhibition at Michigan State University which was called Deep Play Creativity in Math and Arts Through Visual Wordplay, so which is kind of exciting and then I also do a lot of these silly things for fun. Um, and so I think this is sort of ongoing and more to come. So in some ways, I think this is the end of the beginning. And I'm very excited about sort of what would be coming ahead. And so this is the story. Hopefully these themes make sense that, that my scholarship has sort of tried to engage the tangle of practice. And what I call networks of activity, I mean that it's not one thing that I'm doing. You know, people have a research program that do one thing. It's like there are three or four strands sort of going on at the same time. And so when I try to represent it in any linear fashion, it is doing disservice to the complexity of it, to be honest. Because I could have started, I started the story with this is where we are and then said, these are the studies we did. Actually, that's not really true. If I'd have started with the class that I taught first, then any which way of representing it would be uh, incorrect. I think this emphasis on indisciplined learning or transdisciplinary creativity, I think that's an important one that I would like you guys to take away. And I think this thing, which I didn't get a chance to talk about, Dana's dissertation, where she looked at award-winning teachers and what she, uh, where they get their creative ideas from, and it turns out that it's from things that are going on in their, like, you know, interests that they have outside of their professional lives. And so the title of her dissertation in the paper published in TC Record is, We Teach Who We Are. And so in some ways, my attempts at dabbling at, whether it's ambigrams or mathematical poetry, is an attempt to keep that sort of complexity of the phenomena and richness of it sort of alive in my head. And so it's kind of hard to put everything together. Like I said, this map makes, doesn't make much sense. But this is a quote by Lee Shulman that I love, that sometimes you think in order to act, sometimes you act in order to think. And I think that this, I love this quote because I think that's how it has been for me. It's always been both of these going on at the same time. And, I, I, and it's just a wonderful uh, way of being. So one could have called this, I call the talk the swampy lowlands of practice to the unbearable lightness of theory. I could have very easily called it from the unbearable lightness of theory to this, you know, because which comes first, who knows. But the, the reason why this title is that the unbearable lightness of being is this novel by Milan Kundera, which I love. And so I grabbed the unbearable lightness of theory from that. The lowly samplands of practice, uh, swampy lowlands of practice comes from Donald Sean, whose work has, again, 
influenced me a great deal, this idea of reflective practitioner and so on. As it turns out, both of them were interested in jazz. Both of them were trained in jazz. And so again, it was like this connection between this trans, and that influenced the work that they did in their professional lives. So Milan Kundera's novel, Art of the Novel, he has a couple of chapters devoted to how he structures his writing. And it's the most bizarre thing. I think it makes sense only to him. He, like this chapter needs to be short, followed by a long chapter, and then there is to be the counterpoint. Because he's completely building on metaphors of jazz in writing that thing. While you had somebody like Donald Sean take the same ideas of jazz. And in fact, in one of our interviews in Tech Trends, Keith Sawyer talks about it too, in collaboration in jazz where he took it in a completely different direction about how that sort of improvisation while you are performing. And that's what an artist or a designer or a teacher is doing. This idea of a reflective reflection in action, you know. And so that, those are really powerful. So sort of to me, that title sort of captured these two people, right? Kundera and, and, and their interest in jazz and some of the themes that I've been trying to highlight here. And I think it's important as we look at practice, as we look at what we do as educators or designers or whatever we do, that we should never lose sight of the fact that children and teachers in classrooms are conscious, sentient, and purpose of human beings. So no scientific explanation of human behavior could ever be complete. In fact, no unpoetic description of the human condition can ever be complete. So, so, be careful of any philosophy that belongs, can be put in a nutshell because it belongs there. And, you know, these ideas and theories that we take, I think come at it very pragmatically. I take it as, you know, we hold on to these things, but we are ready to let it go. And so as a pragmatist, as somebody who is an educator, I don't buy into any one particular thing. Whatever works is a very powerful sort of philosophy for me. And so, the unbelievable lightness of theory turned around, become the swampy lowlands of practice. I love this design. All right, so I had a quiz in the beginning. I have a pop quiz now to finish, okay, to see if you're paying attention. So here we go. What is the first question? What? Are you ready? Oh my God, you guys are on top of me there. Whew. Good. All right. What does dash, 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 dot, 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 dash, dash, dash represent? SOS, no, it's OSO. Ha, gotcha. One on one, let's see, third one. This is the tiebreaker, right? Which line is longer? They're the same. I knew you were thinking that I made the top one longer. <laughs> Not everything is an illusion, okay? I mean, sometimes it really is longer. All right, started with this quote, started by saying hi. I will end by saying bye. Thank you very much.